Greta slowly walked down the street, pushing a baby carriage in front of her. January of this year was very cold, and Greta regretted leaving her old mittens in her previous apartment in the heat of an argument. Her one-and-a-half-year-old son, Ian, cried in the stroller. The little one was hungry, and his young mother didn't even have enough money for a jar of baby food. "'Hang on, my dear, hang on,' whispered Greta, trying to rock her son to sleep. "'I'll definitely come up with something.' Greta's eyes were filled with tears. Earlier that day, she and her baby were kicked out onto the street by the owner of the apartment Greta had rented for the past couple of months. Mrs. Gottesman suddenly raised the rental price, and when Greta asked why, she immediately began to scream and argue. "'What do you think, honey, that I would keep you and your child for pennies? Prices for everything are rising, you know. There's inflation. It's not profitable for me to rent you out for free.' Greta looked at the landlady with genuine bewilderment and offence. "'But you promised that we could live here, with you, at the same price until spring. "'I've already given you an advance payment.' "'Mrs. Gottesman just shrugged her shoulders. "'Of course you did. That was fair. "'And, by the way, my apartment is good. "'It's only a ten-minute walk from the subway. "'I found tenants who offered me twice as much per month.' Oh, that's it, Greta thought to herself. It's all because of simple greed. But out loud, she asked, OK, we'll leave, but please give us time to find another place, at least a week. Where do I go now with a baby in my arms? Greta pleadingly looked at the landlady, but Mrs. Gottesman was inflexible. That's not my problem, honey. Hurry up and collect your things. And, as they say, all the best. New tenants will move in tomorrow morning. At first, Greta was furious about such injustice, and then she realised that it was useless to persuade Mrs. Gottesman. Therefore, having gathered her things in a shabby bag and put Ian in the stroller, the young mother left the keys in the hallway and silently left the apartment. Her mood was terrible. Most of all, Greta was upset because today was her birthday. Greta turned 25 and she was left alone on the street with a little child in her arms. Trying to warm herself up somehow, the poor woman put her hands in the pockets of her worn-out, once fur-lined coat. There she found a few small bills and coins. Greta sighed heavily. She had three more days until she received her maternity allowance. She hoped she could find an inexpensive hostel nearby, where she could stay with her son, and survive these days. It was freezing outside. Passers-by looked at the crying young woman with a baby stroller in surprise, but preferred not to interfere. Greta desperately wanted to eat. The poor woman had already saved up yesterday to feed Ian, and now her legs were shaking from exhaustion, and her strength could leave the young mother at any moment. "'Oh, God, I hope I have enough money for bread.' Greta thought to herself, exhausted from hunger and stress. If I don't eat, I won't be able to go anywhere. Greta took out a fistful of change from her pocket. She was going to count the coins, but then her hands, numb from the cold, trembled and shook. The coins spilled out onto the road, next to the curb. Unable to see anything around her, Greta took a step forward, intending to pick them up again. At that moment... The pedestrian light turned red. A huge SUV speeding down the icy road almost hit the unfortunate woman. With great difficulty, the driver managed to brake and avoid disaster. The car's bumper froze just a few centimetres from Greta's legs. The driver, a tall young man, jumped out of the car and, slamming the door loudly, shouted all the swear words he could think of. "'What, are you crazy? Tired of living?' Why are you running out into traffic on a red light? Greta, for whom everything happened so fast that she didn't even have time to understand anything, just looked at the man in bewilderment. Then the woman shook, her eyes rolled back, and she collapsed in a faint right into a large snowdrift. Oh my goodness, 
exclaimed the young man, rushing towards the woman. He lightly tapped her cheeks to bring her back to consciousness. Greta, affected by hunger, fatigue and stress, couldn't immediately come to her senses. Finally, the woman woke up. Why did you scare me like that? said the driver, lifting the woman to her feet and brushing the snow off her. Suddenly, he noticed the baby carriage and realized that Greta had just been startled and hadn't had time to react. Meanwhile, a crowd had gathered around the driver's SUV and the woman with a baby. Greta, who by that time had finally regained her senses, thanked the man for his help and immediately knelt down to collect the drop change. Seeing how important it was to her, the driver decided to help. Don't tell me you risked your life for just these coins, he said. You don't understand. These are my last money, Greta answered shortly. I need to eat, otherwise I won't be able to find a place for my son and me to stay overnight. She looked up at her saviour. The driver became embarrassed and immediately said, I didn't mean to offend you. Maybe you'll agree to have dinner with me at the nearby cafe. It's not far from here and we'll feed your baby too. The driver wanted to make amends with Greta and soften his recent rude behaviour towards this young woman. Seeing doubt in Greta's eyes, Ronald added, You have nothing to fear from me. I won't do anything bad to you. On the contrary, I'm ashamed that I didn't understand your situation right away. You'll catch your breath at the cafe, and we'll see where to go from there. Ronald tried to cheer up the stranger, realising what state she was in. Although Greta was worried about inconveniencing the driver with her presence, she eventually agreed. Soon they were sitting in a cosy, charming cafe, and in front of Greta and her son, there was a plate of fragrant chicken soup, as well as the most delicate mashed potatoes with baked salmon and grated cheese. By the expensive business suit and impeccable manners, it was clear that the SUV driver was a wealthy man. Nevertheless, Ronald was very polite and courteous in communication and had the wonderful ability to immediately win over his interlocutor, literally from the first minutes of communication. Greta felt at ease in the presence of this young man, and as it turned out, she was right about his social status. Ronald was the son of a very wealthy and influential businessman. And you, Greta, how did such a wonderful girl end up alone? Does Ian not have a father? The businessman asked carefully. Greta frowned immediately. Ronald, you see, she sighed, you surely know that not all men are willing to take responsibility for their own children. Ian's father turned out to be one of those. I sympathize the man said sincerely. Listen, maybe I can help you. You see, I urgently need a cleaner in my office right now. Of course, I understand that this is not a great job, but still, would you like to try? The businessman really felt sorry for the young mother, and that's why he offered her this position. The man understood that Greta and her child needed food and shelter first and foremost. Greta was hesitant to believe that an unfamiliar and wealthy businessman was willing to help her completely selflessly. If you agree, I'll give you an advance right now, so you can rent a place for a while and pay the nanny to look after your child while you're at work. Greta thought deeply. The man's offer was very attractive. Besides, Greta feared what lay ahead for her and her son. The chance that the businessman was offering her now was truly a gift from fate. A minute later, the woman agreed. Wonderful, Ronald said contentedly, taking a few bills out of his wallet and handing them to the woman. Greta felt herself blushing to the roots of her hair. She thanked Ronald shyly, took the money, and thought that not all was lost for her and her son yet. At the same time, in a representative business class car, on the other side of the city, a conversation was taking place. Well, Irene, it's time for me to pay my debt, said Mario Cavazzoni, a well-known entrepreneur in the city. I hope you won't resist. Remember, if it weren't for me, 
you would have definitely ended up behind bars for your scams with foreigners, and that cell wouldn't have been golden. The beautiful, well-groomed girl sitting across from him casually tossed her long dark hair over her shoulder and said sarcastically, Am I refusing? Tell me what needs to be done, and we'll part ways peacefully. I don't want us to be seen together unnecessarily. Mr. Cavazzoni just smiled and critically looked at the girl from head to toe. Oh, Irene, I see your tongue is still as sharp as ever. All right, listen to me carefully. I want to get rid of Ronald Hale. Get rid of him forever, you understand. I'm sick and tired of him and his transformations. I've spent years getting a controlling stake in this company. I've collected my millions from the company. And now Thomas's son has come to power and is going to destroy the system I've been building for years. No way. Irene raised her eyebrow in surprise. Apparently her boss was really determined, since he spat out his anger like a toad with bile. Mr. Cavazzoni had been a long-term partner of Thomas Hale. They started working together in the early days of the development of the Hales' business. But as often happens, irreconcilable differences arose between the partners, and their paths diverged. Nevertheless, Mr. Cavazzoni always enjoyed the respect of Thomas and his family, to the extent that he even allowed his former partner to acquire a large stake in the company. And now, after the death of Hale Sr., when all the power passed into the hands of his son Ronald, Mr. Cavazzoni quietly decided to get rid of the last obstacle and take over the entire company. That's why he needed the young swindler, Irene Campoli, whom he was instructing right now. I'll help you get into the company, and then you try to charm Ronald somehow. I think it won't be too difficult for you, with your track record. The businessman laughed nastily, making the girl feel uneasy. And what then, she asked. Then I'll tell you separately what you need to do. At these words, Mr. Cavazzoni's face suddenly darkened, and the con artist immediately understood that he was planning something terrible. "'And what's in it for me?' asked the girl, looking directly into the businessman's eyes. He nodded briefly and said, "'You'll get your share, and it'll be quite generous, don't doubt it. The main thing is to do what I say and talk less. Got it?' Irene agreed, and the villains began to carry out their wicked plan. A couple of days later, Mr. Cavazzoni recommended that Ronald take Irene on as an intern. She's a great manager with a lot of experience working for a well-known company. She's a very valuable specialist. You'll see. She'll raise our indicators so much that you'll be thanking me for a whole year. Ronald, who always listened to the opinion of his father's former partner, agreed to take the intern on a probationary period. Let's see what your protégé is capable of, Mr. Cavazzoni. By that time, Ronald had already taken full control of his father's company. At first, when he was just appointed director, the young man was constantly doubting himself. Could he handle such a great responsibility? Would he destroy everything his father had worked so hard to create over the years? His subordinates also didn't immediately accept the young leader, but thanks to his natural resourcedness and creative potential, Ronald was able to literally breathe new life into his father's brainchild, with a record short time of just six months. Two months had passed since Mr. Cavazzoni planted his Trojan horse in the company of the young businessman. During this time, Greta sadly watched as Irene systematically courted her boss. It went without saying that the young employee knew how to skillfully manipulate men and get what she wanted from them, thanks to her aggressive beauty and predatory charm of a tigress. Irene easily captured Ronald's heart with her clawed paws. The man quickly fell for the swindler's hook. Despite his attractiveness, he was not spoiled by female attention, so he easily took the intern's interest at face value. 
Greta just shook her head. She knew perfectly well that behind Irene's supposed feelings for her boss was something else. Completely mercenary. Ironically, they were classmates in the past, so the current cleaner had enough time to study this cunning beauty inside and out. Greta knew for sure that Irene never loved anyone in her life except herself. That's why the young mother didn't believe in her feelings for Ronald at all. However, she still felt a little envious toward Irene. Why? Why does all the best always come to her? The cleaner leaned on the mop with which she was washing the office floor at that moment and involuntarily plunged into memories. Many years ago, Greta moved to the city from the village with her mother. There was nothing to do there because the place where they lived was already considered practically extinct. There was no work or future for a woman and her high school daughter. By that time, Greta's father had already died. An accident while winter fishing deprived their family of the main breadwinner. They began to live much worse, so the girl's mother decided to try her luck in the city. They managed to rent a small house on the outskirts, and Greta got her room in it, which looked more like a pantry. Although the girl was very upset about their poverty, she did not show it. She tried to help her mother with everything, but she could not find a better option for herself than to work as a cleaner in a local shopping centre. Greta herself also helped her mother wash the floors. After school, she always ran home first, to change clothes and then to the store, where she worked an extra shift with her mother. Trying to make her mother's work easier, Greta carried heavy buckets of water and, instead of her, wrung out a rough rag, which her mother attached to the mop. In addition to everything else, Greta began to have problems at school. Being new in the class, she, of course, could not help but attract the attention of other children. Sixteen-year-old Greta stood out sharply against the teenagers from wealthy families. Her modest clothes brought on sale, a backpack that she had seen better days, and the simplest phone. All this made her classmates constantly whisper behind the girl's back. Especially annoying for Greta was one girl whose parents at that time were considered very wealthy. It was the same Irene who now worked with her at the same company. The arrogant girl constantly teased Greta, emphasizing her, as she put it, peasant origin. Well, peasant, are you going to spoil the mood constantly with your dull face? Probably today, again, you will ask to be released early from physical education. Of course you have to help your mum. Who better than you will wash all the floors in the city? It was unbearable for Greta to listen to such words back then. She really got very tired of helping her mother, but she still endured it and never showed her dissatisfaction. The girl knew that besides themselves, no one would help them with anything. Of course, because of poverty and a constant lack of money, Greta felt awkward because she could not dress as beautifully and stylishly as her peers. And in one thing, Irene was right. Her mother worked as a simple cleaner, not the most prestigious position, to say the least. Despite difficult relations with classmates, Greta soon became one of the best students in school. Teachers were often surprised by the diligence and high intelligence of the girl, who was able to multiply large numbers in her mind without resorting to a calculator. Most prominently, these abilities manifested themselves as physics, algebra, and computer science classes. But alas, good grades and respect from teachers did not make her the class leader. Irene continued to tease her until graduation, so Greta was able to breathe freely only when she received her certificate and commendation for excellent academic performance and left the school walls forever. Teachers had predicted a brilliant future for Greta in the field of exact sciences, but she could only sigh sadly. Well, where could she go? To a university? No, she simply couldn't leave her mother alone, so higher education was out of the question. Over the next few years, Greta and her mother struggled to make ends meet in rental apartments, taking on odd jobs whenever they could. 
Greta worked as a cashier in a grocery store, as a salesperson at a market, and even as an order picker at an online store warehouse. But landlords invariably raised the rent, and they still needed to live and dress, so there was never enough money. They saved on everything, and Greta saw no way out of this situation until she met Alex. Alex was a handsome young man who worked as a loader in the same supermarket where Greta worked as a cashier. At the time, Greta was already 23 years old, and her heart was open to a great and deep feeling. Alex immediately appealed to Greta, largely because he seemed like a reliable, stable man. The girl hoped that something would work out between them, perhaps even that her lover would invite her to marry him, especially since he was from the same simple family as Greta. However, her mother did not really like her daughter's new suitor. "'I don't know, darling. I'm not sure about him,' the woman said. "'He has some strange eyes. I don't see any love in them.' "'Mummy, what are you talking about?' Greta asked with a smile. Alex is just tired. No wonder he spent almost ten hours on his feet, and then he came straight to us. And not empty-handed, he brought flowers and a cake. Of course he's good. The girl's mother only really shrugged her shoulders in doubt. It's up to you to decide, Greta, but I wouldn't expect much from him if I were in your place. He's not your man, believe me. The daughter fell silent then, although she was hurt that her mother could not or did not want to share her happiness. However, Greta did not stop dating Alex. Her feelings for this blonde and cheerful guy were too strong. Several more months passed before Greta found out that she was pregnant. Of course, she hurried to tell the father of the child, but her lover, as it turned out, was not ready for this. Greta, are you sure you're really expecting a baby? The man asked hopefully. I heard that women sometimes have false alarms. Greta looked at him in surprise and said confidently, Alex, I visited the doctor, it's all true. The term is still small, but there can be no mistakes. This is your child, and I am infinitely happy that I will soon become a mother. Alex slowly looked away, then looked around, checking if anyone would hear them in the supermarket's utility room. Greta... Well, it's like... What? A worried shadow flashed in the girl's eyes. You see, it's not the right time for this. Greta just waved her hands as if saying that's how it always is. The girl wanted to ask the guy what they should do next, but their conversation was interrupted. They urgently needed to go to the store. After that, for the rest of the day, Alex preferred to stay away from the girl and if they did meet, he timidly averted his eyes from his beloved. Greta then thought for the first time about how she would live if, God forbid, she remained completely alone. After all, her mother was already old, and Greta could not hang the care of her future child on her, and there was little hope for Alex. The girl's fears were confirmed when the next day Alex abruptly quit and disappeared in an unknown direction. He even asked the accountant to send him the calculation by mail, saying that he was rushing to do important things in another city. Greta was not naive, and immediately realized that her fiancé had run away from her, not wanting to take responsibility. Greta's heart was broken. Her mother had warned her that she would cry because of Alex, but the daughter did not believe it, and it turned out exactly like that. The pregnancy was difficult and Greta was constantly forced to be hospitalized. The young woman was distressed that her mother was left alone at such times without supervision. Once, when Greta was discharged after another preservation, she returned home and found her mother dead from a heart attack. The daughter's horror cannot be described in words. Her neighbors helped with the funeral. Greta gave them all the little money that she had saved at that time but she was unable to make all the necessary preparations. It seemed to her that her life was over. Her nearest and dearest person had left her, and she was left alone in this harsh world. From that moment on, life became a series of trials for the young woman. 
She had to quickly move out of the apartment because the landlady did not want to tolerate what she called problematic tenants. The future mother had to find another place to live. Meanwhile, she was laid off from the supermarket where she worked while she was in the hospital. The store owner did not want to pay the pregnant employee her maternity leave, so he decided to cheat by accusing the poor woman of a non-existent shortage as a pretext. Greta wanted to complain, but to whom? No one would protect her from arbitrariness, and she just resigned herself to what had happened. After that, wherever Greta went, she was refused work. In the end, to get at least something, the woman had to lie, hiding her pregnancy. This allowed her to stay afloat for some time. She worked as a dishwasher and cleaner at a restaurant. However, when she could no longer hide her state, she resigned from her job. With the birth of her son, the situation changed, but not for the better. Greta began to receive a childcare allowance. However, it was so meager that the unfortunate woman often went hungry herself just to feed little Ian. They had nowhere to live properly. The office cleaner position that the young mother received not long ago became a life-saving cycle for her and Ian, helping them survive the turbulent ocean of worldly troubles. Greta tried to do her job well and not attract attention from other employees. She understood perfectly her position in the team and therefore increasingly remained silent and didn't get close to anyone. If someone greeted her, she greeted them back, but that was all. However, fate still brought her face to face with Irene. The beauty was very surprised by their meeting, but didn't miss the opportunity to take a jab at Greta. Oh, Greta, I didn't know you worked here too. The girl looked the cleaner up and down, then squinted and said in a dissatisfied tone, I see you've chosen the right path in life. I respect people who know their place and don't meddle where they shouldn't. Stay on your own side of the fence. Irene smirked and walked past her former classmate, throwing a piece of paper into the bucket of water. Despite holding on as best she could, Greta felt incredible pain and hurt deep down inside. She did not understand what made her worse than Irene, except for the lack of money. But money doesn't make a person good, and she, more than anyone else, had already learned that. The only person in the company with whom Greta always talked friendly was the director, Ronald Hale. The young businessman understood very well how difficult the situation with the young cleaner was, and therefore tried to do everything possible to ease it. Ronald and Greta were about the same age, except that the man was a couple of years older, although they didn't chat in the cafeteria for employees and were rarely caught alone. These two respected each other. For the first time since the birth of her son, Greta could breathe calmly. Only now did she feel relative stability and confidence in tomorrow. However, there was still something in her daily hustle that she initially even hid from herself. The fact was that Greta gradually felt increasingly in love with her boss. Every time she saw him, her cheeks were filled with a hot blush, as if she were turning into a young and naive girl, thirsty for a strong and deep feeling. Greta suffered, seeing how Irene so easily won Ronald's heart. But all that was left for the poor cleaner was to endure. Who is she to him? Just a girl mopping floors and collecting garbage on the floors? Greta bitterly realised that their social status gap would never allow them to be together. Meanwhile, the intern scammer was able to fully implement her plan. Ronald was so charmed by her that, according to the girl herself, he was willing to eat out of her hand. Ronald completely lost control over himself. He was ready to fulfill any desire of his green-eyed beauty manager. Greta, seeing all this, could only grip the mop handle even tighter. In her opinion, Irene was not even worthy of the director's little finger. One day, while cleaning the men's restroom, Greta overheard a strange conversation. The toilet was designed in such a way that the audibility between the men's and women's compartments was excellent. 
Hearing a familiar voice, Greta stopped and listened carefully. Mario, you need to act faster, demanded Irene, whose voice Greta immediately recognized. I'm already tired, honestly. I have to powder my nose and run to a date with this fool now. He's already hooked. I have the documents and general power of attorney, fake signatures, and I've already ordered the necessary people too. It's just a matter of a little work. Damage the brakes in his car and voila. An accident on the road, and we'll finally get what we deserve. You, as the holder of the majority of the shares, will become the rightful owner of the company, and I'll receive my percentage and leave with a light heart abroad. From the phone receiver, which Irene put on loudspeaker as she applied her makeup, the low voice of businessman Mr. Cavazzoni was heard. Well, Irene, congratulations, you're great. You so skillfully fooled the guy, and, most importantly, you have done your job excellently. You got the papers I needed. Without them, my whole plan would have been for nothing. All right, I'll talk to someone. Maybe some of my guys will do everything tonight. Ronald still parks his official car in the company's general garage, right? Yeah, the invisible interlocutor said. Greta was horrified to learn that these two were planning something terrible for Ronald. She clamped her mouth with her hand to avoid screaming and tried to call her boss to warn him. However, despite multiple calls, Ronald did not pick up. Apparently, this seductress had so turned the boss's head that he did not want to notice anything in front of him. Greta had nothing else to do but go home empty-handed. The rest of the evening, the young mother spent on pins and needles, and at night, she could not sleep at all. The next morning, she ran straight to the security post. She had two hours left until her shift started. Please, check Mr. Hale's car, she pleaded with the security guard. I'm sure something's wrong with it. This is a matter of life and death. Moved by the cleaning lady's concern for their director's safety, the security guard decided to help Greta. After inspecting the boss's car, the guard was shocked to find that the brake hose in the car was indeed damaged, and that a small puddle of brake fluid had already formed under the car, which continued to leak from the hose. An hour later, when the director arrived at the office and learned of the incident, he was shocked. Does that mean that somebody wanted to kill me? But who? Greta told him about the conspiracy she had inadvertently overheard. It turned out that the businessman's old partner had planned the calculated and cold-blooded attack. Ronald became furious when he learned that Irene was involved. Hold this scoundrel for a moment. Meanwhile, I'll call the police. I'm sure there's a lot she can tell them. The security services caught the fraudster and handed her over to the police. Irene immediately asked to cooperate with them. She gave up Mr. Cavazzoni and his assistants. The conspirators are now facing trial and a long prison term. Thank you, Greta, the young businessman blushed and thanked the cleaning lady. If it weren't for you, I would probably already be on the other side. Greta blushed but waved her hand, saying that she simply could not leave such a terrible crime unnoticed. A couple of days later, she found a large vase of live flowers in her work area, white roses, orchids, and several stunningly beautiful asters. There was a small note attached to the bouquet with just a few words, for the most attentive and honest person in the world. Greta was overwhelmed with emotion. She could not believe that Ronald had given her such a beautiful bouquet. Allow me to drive you home today, Ronald asked her with a smile. I hope you liked the flowers. So it was you, Greta gasped in amazement. I'm sorry, but no one has ever given me such beauty before. Thank you. Greta felt her heart beating strongly, and every beat sent a pleasant warmth through her veins. Ronald, on the other hand, felt a strange excitement. It was as if his eyes had opened for the first time in his life. He saw both the gentle, unobtrusive beauty of Greta and the amazing light that shone from within her wonderful blue eyes. That evening, 
Ronald drove Greta home, and it marked the beginning of a beautiful, tender, and gentle romance that quickly grew into a truly deep and strong relationship between them. Now the couple is pleased and getting ready for their upcoming wedding, after which Ronald plans to immediately adopt Ian and give him his name. The businessman is convinced that his adopted son will become an excellent heir and continue his work, and then, God willing, his adopted son will have a little brother or sister. <laughs>